Okay, I'd like us to turn again, please, to the book of Judges, chapter 1, and I'd like to read uh, from verse 16 down to verse 29, although we may get further than that, but anyway, for our purpose of reading, uh, verse 16, it says this, And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Hormah. And Judah took Gezer uh, with the coast thereof and Ascalon and the coast thereof and Ekron with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. And the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph sent to describe Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Lutz. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city. And they said unto him, show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man go and all his family. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name thereof Luz, which is the name thereof unto this day. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshan and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblim and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. And our our title this morning is very simple. We want to think about chariots and compromise. Chariots and compromise. So as we begin verse 16, it talks about the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, and how he went up out of the city of palm trees, which is Jericho, with the children of Judah to the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad. And they went and dwelt there among the people. Now, several things that need to be mentioned here. First of all, the family connection uh, that led to friendly relationships between the Israelites and the Kenites, who were actually Midianites uh, of the wilderness. Uh, And so if you look back to Numbers chapter 10, Of course, we get the background here. And in a sense, we're getting a fulfillment of what Moses said to his father-in-law here in this section, allowing them to dwell amongst them. And so verse 29 of Numbers chapter 10, it says, Moses said to Hobab, the son of Raguel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we're journeying unto the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Uh, Come thou with us, and we will do thee good, for the Lord hath spoken good concerning Israel. And he said unto him, I will not go, but I will depart to my own land and to my kindred. And he said, Leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, that thou mayest be be to us instead of eyes. And it shall be, if thou go with us, yea, it shall be that... What goodness the Lord shall do unto us, the same will we do unto thee. And so this is now fulfilled. uh, And of course, the reason why we're being told it here, particularly in this chapter, is that there's a lot of things in this chapter that are setting the scene for that which will come afterwards. And so, for instance, uh, we're going to see a Kenite uh, later on in the chapter. Uh, We're going to see Jael, and she's going to have a 
significant impact for good for the nation of Israel when she drives the tent peg through Sisera's head. And so the question is, well, how did uh, she get there? How was she a Kenite amongst the people of Israel? And so this is kind of explaining a little bit of the background. And of course, the city of palm trees, we know, is a reference to Jericho, uh, nestled deep in the Jordan Valley, northeast of Jerusalem. And so this, uh, again, is just simply setting the scene and showing us that these Kenites dwelt amongst the people of Israel. And then it says, and Judah went with Simeon, his brother, verse 17, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Hormah. And Judah took Gaza with the course thereof, and Ashkelon with the course thereof, and Ekron with the course thereof. So it seems all success, Judah having great success, uh, driving out the Canaanites, uh, gaining cities, doing really well, uh, and uh, tremendous blessing. And yet what we find is that Judah was not able to hold on to these gains. And so, for instance, uh, in verse 18, we have reference to, to Gaza, Ekron, Ashkelon. And we won't go too far in the book of Judges, and we find that those places are in the hands of the enemy once again. In fact, they're in the hands of the Philistines. And so let's just uh, see this. Look, for instance, at Judges 14 and verse 19, where these very cities that Judah conquered are now uh, subject once again to the enemy. And so 14, 19, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, this is Samson, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his hunger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. So Ashkelon, uh, he's going to spoil them, the judge Samson, but uh, they'd already been conquered previously, but now we're back in the enemy's land, uh, in the enemy's hands. Chapter 16 and verse 1. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in unto her. So again, Gaza, Philistine territory once more and uh, <clears throat> no longer under the control of Israel. And then if you look at 1 Samuel, a book that we're well familiar with, chapter 5 and verse 10, therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron and it came to pass as the ark of God came to Ekron that the Ekronites cried out saying they have brought up the ark of God of Israel to us, to slay us and our people. So this land conquered by Judah, and yet it seems that they were not able really to kind of take advantage of it and to go in and enjoy the land and inherit the land. And they were able to take it, but they weren't able to keep it. And pretty soon uh, the enemy uh, came back and came back forcefully and took the land from them. In fact, uh, what's perhaps more horrendous is if you look at Judges chapter 15 and verse 11, the very uh, tribe of Judah that had enjoyed such success in driving out those in Gaza, Ekron, and Ashkelon, and yet in Judges 15 verse 11, these very men of Judah uh, verse 11, it says, then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock Etam and said to Samson, knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, as they did to me, so have I done unto them. And so how tragic that they win a strategic victory. They're not able to maintain it. It becomes part of the enemy's hands, and eventually the, the very tribe that had conquered them said to Samson, you know, stop messing around, Samson. Don't you realize that, that the Philistines rule over us? And so what, what is the practical implication for us? It tells us that it's possible to have victory in an area in our lives, but we, we cannot in any way kind of, as it were, uh, go easy because the enemy is stubborn 
and the enemy has a tendency to come back. And often in the very same areas where we've experienced victory and we think we're doing well, and then the enemy can come back and ultimately recapture ground from us that we had won from him. And so it's a, it's a warning to us to be very careful. Uh, we, we can never kind of become complacent. Uh, the enemy doesn't ever give up and he's resilient, he's persistent, and we're going to be fighting battles spiritually until the day that we're raptured. And so we need to recognize that and not ever uh, let our guard down, become complacent, because conquered territory, once again, uh, became in the hands of the enemy. And ultimately, the, the children of Judah uh, became subject to the enemy and in total bondage to the enemy, and even were offended that somebody had tried to deliver them, as in the case of Samson. So what we can see is something had gone terribly wrong in the intervening years between Judges chapter 1 and this conquering in verse 18 and Judges chapter 15, where Judah are completely subject to their enemies. And again, we're going to see today that the, the slide is slow and it's kind of a general drifting. It, it's not overnight. It's a, it's a slow general drifting into that position where instead of walking in victory, being in complete defeat and in subject uh, to the enemy in every way. And so verse 19, it says, the Lord was with Judah and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountains. Now, if we stop there, it would be a wonderful story. You've seen Judah go from victory to victory to victory. But then we see this word, but. It says, the Lord was with Judah. He drove out the inhabitants of the mountains, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. Now, why couldn't Judah drive out the inhabitants of the valley? It's because their eyes, instead of being fixed on the Lord who was with them and had given them victory after victory after victory, their eyes became fixed on the iron chariots. And it's, it's this principle, isn't it? We, we talked about Caleb in a previous study. Others saw the giants. Caleb saw the Lord. And it's when we get our eyes off the Lord and we get our eyes on the enemy or the circumstances that we begin to feel uh, inadequate. We begin to sense our uh, defeat, all the rest of it. And so we might ask ourselves, where are our eyes? Uh, we're living in days that are very challenging. These are days that we've none of us have been through before. But if, if all our focus is on the media and the pandemic and the mandates and all of this stuff, we are going to become powerless individuals because we're intimidated by all of this stuff going on. We're looking at the chariots. We're looking at the giants. On the other hand, if our focus is on the Lord, we are enabled to walk in victory, even over the chariots of our day. And so if our eyes are fixed on the Lord, it doesn't matter how formidable our foe might be, it can be overcome. But if our eyes are on the obstacle, if you're focused on the problem, if you're in bondage to your past, you'll never drive it out. And it's true. I, I've dealt with people on different issues. And uh, if, if people keep looking at their sin, they never, ever seem to get victory over it. And it's only when they get their eyes off their sin and their eyes on the Savior do they begin to see victory in their lives. I remember a guy gave his testimony. He had struggled greatly uh, with pornography in his life. And he'd been to seminar after seminar. And of course, all these seminars are focusing on the problem. And he never, ever seemed to get victory. And uh, I, I was speaking at a conference. I spoke on victory in Christ. And he said that was a turning point in his life. He got his eyes off the problem. He got his eyes on the Savior. And he said he's enjoyed four years of continual victory because his eyes are not on the problem, but on the Savior. And that's where we need to see, looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, not focused on the problem. And, and so 
This is the tragedy that Judah, who had known the, the, the Lord's help, the Lord's hand with them, the Lord was with Judah, but he could not because he got his eyes off the Lord and got it onto the chariots. Now, is a chariot an issue for the Lord? I mean, is, is that too difficult for him? And I want us to just look at a few scriptures to show us that the Lord didn't have any difficulty with chariots. He's dealt with them before. He can deal with them again. And so let's just look at a few scriptures about God and chariots. So let's look, please, at Psalm 68. Psalm 68 and verse 17. Psalm 68, verse 17, it says, The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in that holy place. And so we're reminded that God has his chariots, uh, and he has his hosts. And, of course, remember at times past where uh, the, uh, the servant I believe, was it of Elijah? I always get him mixed up, Elijah or Elisha. It saw uh, the, the strength of the enemy, and the Lord opened his eyes, and he saw the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. And uh, what, a, what a sight that was to see the angelic horse. There are more with us than there are against us. And so another psalm, Psalm 20. Again, just to see uh, this issue of chariots and God, and we're going to see that they're not an issue for him in any way. Psalm 20. Verse 7, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. In other words, our confidence is not in chariots or technology or any of these things, but it's in the name of the Lord our God. And as we uh, think uh, back to the book of Joshua, we see that the Israelites, when their eyes were focused on the Lord, when they were walking believingly, had no difficulty in overcoming armies that had many chariots. And so, for instance, uh, Joshua 11, verse 4, it says, They went out, they and all their hosts, with them much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude, with horses and chariots, very many. And when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched, against, uh, pitched together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. And the Lord said to Joshua, be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hawk their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Merim suddenly, and they fell upon them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them to the great Zidon and to Mizreph for Themeim, and unto the valley of Mizpah eastwards. And they smote them until they left them none remaining. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hawked their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. So they've already had a track record of defeating armies with multitudes of soldiers and with chariots. And again, how could they not remember uh, what had happened in the past, even to Pharaoh and his army and the chariots? Back in Deuteronomy chapter 20, they had a promise from God. In Deuteronomy 20, verse 1, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And so don't be intimidated. And, and the tragedy is that they failed to remember his word and his promises. God has said, when you come into the land and you see the chariots, don't worry about them. The Lord is with thee. And he uh, will indeed give you victory like we, you saw over the Egyptians. And so the power of God was there. It was available to them. Jehovah was with his people. And so what are chariots of iron when you have the Lord with you? They might as well uh, have been made. This is C.A. Coates' comment. He said they might as well have been made of tissue paper, <laughs> all of those chariots, when Jehovah was with them, if they would simply have trusted in him. And later on, we're going to see that Deborah and Barak, again, this is 
we said this chapter is really setting the scene for things that are about to come in chapters up ahead. Deborah and Barak are going to face Sisera's army <clears throat> with all his chariots. And they would prove that chariots were not an issue. When God was depended upon, these things were easily disposed of. God's track record is absolutely marvelous in dealing with this. Again, we don't have to go too far. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 14. And just another couple of references before we leave the chariots behind. But a couple more references. Exodus 14, verse 23 through 25, where we read this. <clears throat> it says, The Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And so again, what a, what a great picture you've got here that uh, this is their history. They had forgotten their history. How easy it is for us to forget what God has done uh, and to focus on the problems of the present, take our eyes off the Lord, uh, fail to look back and see the great victories that he has given in times past and trust him for present victories. And that's exactly what happened to Judah. One more reference, Psalm 76, verse 6. At thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse are cast into a dead sleep. At your rebuke, the chariot and horse are cast into a dead sleep. And so, again, where's our confidence? Where's our focus? I, I suppose those are the two big things that really come out of this, right? Where's our focus? Is it on the Lord or is it on the chariots of our day? Is it on the... The, the obstacles, the difficulties of our, is it on him or is it on them? And then secondly, uh, not only is our focus, where's our trust and our confidence? Is it in the Lord that can deal with all of the problems that we face easily and simply? He's able to cast the horse and the chariot into a dead sleep. It's not a problem for him. And then verse 20, it says, they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. Now, again, we've already talked about that in the previous lesson. And so God keeps reminding us of Caleb. God keeps reminding us of somebody who wholly followed the Lord, who faced his own obstacles. The obstacles he faced were the sons of Anak. They were giants. And yet God was with Caleb. He trusted fully the Lord and was able to overcome and to capture Hebron. So we kept keep getting reminded of Hebron. We keep getting reminded of Caleb, this great man who wholly followed the Lord. And there's a reason for that. He's going to, I believe, put in contrast for us again, Caleb, not only with Judah, who saw the chariots instead of seeing the Lord, but also with Benjamin in verse 21 because it says the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. So basically it's just set as a simple contrast. So Benjamin <clears throat> bordered to Judah, if you remember, and uh, <clears throat> the land was allotted to Benjamin. In Joshua 18 and verse 28, we read that. Let me just go back there. This land was actually allotted to them. 1828, and Zela, Eleth, and Jebusai, which is Jerusalem, Gibeath, and Kirjath, 14 cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the children of Benjamin, according to their families. So this was their inheritance, but they could not or did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem and the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. And so they weren't able to occupy the city, even though back in verse eight, it says 
Now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And so, again, it it had been already defeated, uh, but they somehow were not able to hold on to it. The enemy came back, and now Benjamin attempts to uh, defeat them but it did not drive out the Jebusites. And again, we know not until the days of David in 2 Samuel 5 were the Jebusites finally removed from Jerusalem, and it would become uh, both David's uh, city uh, and also, of course, the eternal capital uh, of the people of God. And yet the Jebusites stubbornly held on all the way into the days of David. And again, we we look back to Benjamin and what God had said about him uh, back in Genesis 49, and we see that he really was failing to live up to what was prophesied concerning him. In Genesis 49 and verse 27, it says, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning, he shall devour the prey, and at night, he shall divide the spoil. And so there was great expectation that this this tribe would be like a a wolf. It would devour its enemies, and yet they failed miserably to do this. And again, as I said, the contrast is set between Caleb driving out the three sons of Anak and the failure of both Judah and Benjamin. Caleb saw the Lord. Others saw the giants. Judah saw the chariots. And, of course, Caleb did not drive out the Jebusites. And he says, they dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. And remember we said when we talked about the authorship that this was written during the early days of the kingdom, the, the, the monarchy. Uh, they're, they're, he's writing about a time when there was no king in Israel. He's writing about a time when the Jebusites were still in Jerusalem. uh, And it it wouldn't be until David's reign that the Jebusites would be removed. So we've looked at chariots, and now we want to think about compromise. And I want to give you a little bit of an an outline uh, for verses 22 down to verse 34, the remainder of the chapter. And we're going to see a very interesting pattern Uh, in the text that is highlighted, I believe, for a reason. And so in verses 22 down to verse 26, we're going to see that the Canaanites were allowed to live at a distance from the Israelites. I'm going to read about a story of somebody who's going to help them uh, to uh, find a way in to the city of Bethel, and they're going to allow this man to go free, and he's going to go and live among the Hittites, and he's going to live at a distance from them. And so the Canaanites are allowed to live at a distance from the Israelites. Now, keep that in your mind as we move on. And then, verses 27 through 30, we're going to see that the Canaanites are allowed to live among the Israelites, no longer at a distance, but they're allowed to live amongst them. They, they couldn't drive them out. They ended up putting them to tribute. They allowed them to live amongst them. Then the third section, verse 31 through 33, we're going to see that there's a a turning of the tide and the Israelites are allowed to live amongst the Canaanites. And we're going to see a a subtle change in the whole uh, section, 31 through 33, where it seems like the roles are reversed. The Canaanites are in the ascendancy, and they're allowing the Israelites to live among them rather than the other way around. And then we get to verse 34, and we find the Israelites are allowed to live at a distance from the Canaanites. It says, the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. So they're allowing them to live not among them, but at a distance from them. They can have the mountains, but they can't come down to the valley. And so we see a a real pattern, and it all begins with little compromises. And we're going to see how this is, it it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, It takes time, but a little compromise here, a little compromise there, and it, it changes the whole scene and reverses everything. And the Lord's people go from victory to defeat. 
uh, because of compromise. And so we've, we've think, been thinking about Judah particularly and Simeon up to this point. From verse 21, we have Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. So we're, we're looking at different tribal groupings and how they related to the Canaanites. And we're going to see a common thing between all of these groups. They all failed to overcome the enemy and allowed these godless nations to continue living in their tribal territory. And so there was they, they weren't overcomers. They weren't living the overcoming life. Uh, they, they allowed the enemy uh, to live amongst them, and they, they weren't serious about the commission that God had given to them, which was to, to destroy the Canaanites. And so it's a series of tribal defeats, and it shows us that Israel is no longer walking by faith, no longer trusting God to give them victory, no longer taking serious his commission that he has given to them. And the tragedy is that the remaining Canaanites are not so much a military threat to the nation of Israel, but a spiritual cancer that would eat away at them. I want to just show you what I mean by this. When you look back to Exodus 34, Exodus chapter 34, about going easy on the Canaanites and how that would prove to be a spiritual cancer to the nation of Israel. And so in Exodus 34, verse 11, he says, Observe thou that which I commanded, command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves, for thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go a-whoring after their gods and do sacrifice to their gods and one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. And so basically he's warning them, you cannot play around with the Canaanites because of their uh, defilement morally, because of their religious beliefs, you cannot compromise with them at all. You must utterly wipe them out. You must utterly destroy their altars. And so that's why Israel is told to eliminate the Canaanites and the other ites and to wreck and demolish completely their worship centers. Uh, it, it would be like a surgeon who removes only part of the cancer because even cancer has, in his opinion, a right to grow and find fulfillment. <laughs> That's not a doctor you want, right? You want somebody who's going to remove it utterly. And I, I just want to say this, that tolerance and suicide always go hand in hand spiritually. Tolerance and suicide go hand in hand. And we are I think we're witnessing it. Uh, we're witnessing the death of Western culture and civilization. How did that come about? I think by a tolerant attitude towards that which is clearly deviant in the word of God. And it's destroying, like a cancer, our present culture and eating it alive. And so the Israelites were told, in a sense, be like a surgeon, cut out the cancer and do not in any way compromise with it. And the story, as we read it here, although their work began in earnest, it gradually weakened. The Lord was with Judah. Victories resulted. The Lord was, I'm going to see here, was with Joseph at Bethel. And Bethel was taken. 
Manasseh and Ephraim, all and all the rest, weakened in the work, and the Canaanites were left in possession. And I think it's true to say that it, it's easy to start out well and start out strong, but to keep going and keep on without veering at all, uh, with zeal for the work of God, that is the challenge all of us face. And it's very easy, if we're not careful, to compromise in little areas. So as we go through this section, we're going to witness these little compromises in how they were going to have an impact. And so verse 22, it says, The house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And they sent to describe Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. And the spy saw a man come forth out of the city. And they said to him, show us, we pray thee, the entrance to the city, and we will show thee mercy. When he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and all his family. The man went to the land of the Hittites, built a city, called the name thereof Luz, which is the name thereof unto this day. So it begins by telling us that the Lord was with them. It emphasizes this, that the Lord was with them. The house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel. The Lord was with them. Jehovah was with them. And so it really is, is given to accentuate their failure. God was with them. So why did they compromise? Why did they want to help, uh, to solicit help of a citizen, one of the inhabitants of the city, which were all devoted to destruction? They solicited help from that which they were set to overthrow. And the result was they perpetuated what God was set to destroy. He wanted Luz destroyed and replaced with Bethel, if you like. And yet this man who was spared, he let go. And what does he do? He goes and rebuilds Luz in another place. Luz, by the way, of course, we know Bethel. It means house of God. It's got great spiritual significance. This is where uh, Jacob wrestled with God. This is Genesis 28. This is tremendous spiritual significance. And Luz means deceit or perversion. And so God wanted deceit and perversion destroyed, and he wanted the house of God to be established. And so this is the, 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 the background, really, to this little section. And so the house of Joseph, that would be Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, the two sons of Joseph. Of course, Ephraim, second in size uh, and in power and influence to Judah. So pretty powerful uh, tribe. And they attacked together unitedly, like, just like Judah and Simeon had done. And they set out to take uh, this house uh, <clears throat> of God, or Bethel, and it laid within the territory of Ephraim. And so they're working together, Ephraim and Manasseh, to do this. And then it says in, in verse 24, obviously this is a fortified city, and it's very hard to see a, a weak spot or a way to get in to destroy the city. And so they basically see a man, and they ask him if he will tell them a way into the city. Now, remember, God would desire that Luz disappear. He, he wants deceit and perversion gone, eradicated, and Bethel, the house of God, to be established. But the result of their getting help from this source was that another Luz was set up. Now, the question we might ask is, if the Lord was with them, would not he show them a way into the city? If they had sought his mind, could he not have helped them? And again, sometimes what we seek to do is get help from the world rather than seeking God's help to overcome difficulties. And of course, the problem with seeking help from the world is we become indebted to the world and we owe them and we have to repay them. One good turn deserves another. 
And so they, they say to this man, you know, if you show us a way in, we will show you kindness. Again, God had given them no mandate to do this. They were supposed to destroy this man. And so he did show them the entrance to the city. They did allow him to leave. And what we learn about this man in verse 26, and, and I want to suggest a real contrast here with Rahab the harlot. If you remember the story of Rahab the harlot, she was a help in hiding the spies, but she threw her lot in with the people of God. She had no desire to perpetuate Jericho whatsoever. Uh, she actually would become part of the messianic line. But in contrast, this individual who they made a deal with, it tells us uh, that in verse 26, the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name thereof Luz, which is the name thereof to this day. So this man's affections were not identified with Bethel at all, the house of God, but with Luz. With, with deceit and perversion. He loved the old place, and he calls the new city Luz, and it stood until they're writing uh, this uh, account. So different from Rahab, whose heart had already been captured by the Lord. She'd heard about his marvelous deeds in destroying Egypt, and she uh, wanted to be in with the people of God. But this man, on the other hand, remember we said the children of Israel allow him to, and he's a Canaanite, they allow him to live at a distance from them. Not among them, but a distance from them. They allow, they spare the man, and of course he perpetuates that which God wanted destroyed. And we might just say this, that when we think of enemies, one of the struggles that many of the people of God are going through is that they don't want to be done with the old life. And they still love perversion and deceit more than they love the house of God. And they're never going to really enjoy what God intended for them because they're compromised. Verse 27, it says, neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshan and her towns, not Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, the inhabitants of Iblim and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but Canaanites would dwell in the land. And you, you see something of the determination of the Canaanites here. They would dwell in the land. In other words, they're making a stand. We're, we're not giving up this land. We're going to stay here. And because they would dwell in the land, exercising their will, and the Israelites allow things to be, to be, to continue that are determined by the will of man rather than following the will of God. Now, again, if you go back to Joshua chapter 17, you'll find that in the days of Joshua, these very cities had already been destroyed. But again, the enemy in his stubbornness had come back and reestablished a stronghold in these very places. Joshua 17, verse 16, we read this. And the border came down to the end of the mountain that lieth before the valley of the son of Hinnom, and which is in the valley of the giants on the north, and descended to the valley of Hinnom on the side of Jebusai on the south, and descended to Enrogel. That's chapter 18. And that's why it is not making any sense whatsoever. Chapter 17, verse 16. The children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron both they who are of Bethshan and her towns and they who are of the Valley of Jezreel. So these, these areas, Valley of Jezreel, and um, these various towns that are mentioned in verse 27, why was it that Manasseh didn't drive them out? Well, it's the chariot problem, once again. He mentions in, in Joshua 17, uh, verse 16, the chariot problem. But back in Joshua 12, these had previously been defeated. Joshua 12, 
verse 21. It says, in all the cities of the plain and all the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites. I'm doing a good job here. That's chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 12, verse 21. The king of Tanakh won, the king of Megiddo won, the king of Kedesh won, the king of Jokneam of Carmel won, the king of Dor in the coast of Dor won, the king of the nations of Gilgal won. And so we have mentioned Megiddo, we, we have mentioned Dor, uh, we have Tanakh mentioned. All of these were kings that had been defeated previously by Joshua, but had regained a foothold. And of course, uh, this valley of Megiddo uh, was entirely suitable for the chariots of iron. It's flat land, the mountains are more difficult for the chariots. And so uh, the Canaanite tanks, if you like, could maneuver freely uh, in the Megiddo Valley. And as a result of that, it says, neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshan and her towns, nor Tanakh, even though they had previously been defeated by Joshua they now had been, the enemy had come back, regained a foothold, and Manasseh, Manasseh didn't drive them out. Verse 28, it came to pass when Israel was strong, they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Here's another little compromise. It's not that Manasseh couldn't drive out their enemies, because it says when Israel was strong. So in other words, they, they have what's needed. Just like we have all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. They were strong. And yet it says, instead of driving out the Canaanites, it says they put them to tribute. And so basically, it's not that they could not drive them out because they're strong. Now it's that they would not drive them out because they saw financial advantage in putting them to tribute making money by taxing them, using them as, uh, if you like, a forced labor force. Uh, and of course, you could rationalize very easily that this is the way to go. I mean, didn't this make perfect sense? I mean, we can get we can get a revenue stream from these people and they can work for us. They can do all kinds of, uh, of uh, work that we don't want to do. And as a result, they allowed them to stay there and of course, with all the corruption that went with it, instead of obeying the simple commands of God, they, instead of driving them out and destroying them all, it says they didn't drive them out. Instead, they put them to tribute. They're strong. They could have done it. But instead of expelling, instead of driving out these enclaves, they put them to forced labor. And again, it would, it would reap a tremendous and horrendous consequences for them. We'll finish with verse 29. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Giza, but the Canaanites dwelt in Giza among them. Of course, Giza, Giza in the south, that would remain in the hands of the Canaanites until the days of Solomon, when actually Pharaoh would drive them out to give a gift to his daughter uh, when she married Solomon. And so it would be a Canaanite stronghold right the way to the days of Solomon. And again, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanite. Even though they're, after Judah, we said they're the strongest tribe in terms of numerically strong. Uh, Joshua, remember, was from the tribe of Ephraim. I mean, a great track record, great history but they didn't. So as we bring our thoughts to a close after this session, I guess, again, we just need to reiterate these simple principles. Chariots and compromise. What are the chariots of our day that's causing us to walk in defeat? Is it that we've got our eyes on the problems and not on the Lord? Don't we have the promise that the Lord is with us? Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. We have his promise. He's with us. We, we, we have uh, his power at our disposal. We're, we're even indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit. And yet, if we're focuses on the problems, 
We're going to go from defeat to defeat to defeat. Our eyes must be on the Lord, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And then secondly, compromise. And it's always small compromises to begin with. But then we begin to compromise. Once we start that, it, it leads to other compromises, other compromises. And before you know where you are, the enemy is comfortable among you instead of driving them out. And so tragically, we see here uh, a kind of a mantra that goes through. They did not drive out, verse 21. Neither did Manasseh drive out, verse 27. Verse 28, they did not utterly drive them out. Verse 29, neither did Ephraim drive them out. And so the enemy lived amongst them and was comfortable in their presence. And they, as we're going to see through the book of Judges, would degenerate quickly because this spiritual cancer that should have been cut out would begin to do its work in their very souls. May the Lord challenge us about these things, are the areas in my life that I once had no truck with, but now I'm compromising. Are the areas, I think maybe I think I can defeat them at will at any time. And are there chariots that I'm looking at that is inhibiting, inhibiting me from really walking in victory? May the Lord help us and speak to us through these things. Mm -hmm.